Welcome to the Essential Craftsman Podcast. I'm Nate, and our guest today is Brad Levitt. Brad is a custom home builder in Scottsdale, Arizona. His business, AFT Construction, has a beautiful Instagram account that I highly recommend you find. You can see the pictures of the work they do. Brad joins us to talk about building these high-end homes. We talk about architects and designers. We talk about social media and how it can help uh, contractors. And I'll mention, Brad makes a point. This is a teaser. Brad makes a point about social media and, and how it's helpful for contractors and tradesmen that is really persuasive. And if you're on the fence about whether it would you know, be necessary for your business, I, I bet you he will convince you. So stick around for that. Hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, Brad Levitt. To start with, if you could just give us and myself a background about your your career, I know you you uh you came through you went to school unlike a lot of uh, builders, but maybe give us the overview of how you kind of got to where you are at the moment, and then we'll get into the specifics of your business. Sure thing, Nate. So it's interesting, you know, I, all of us take different paths to our career, right? And for me, I grew up in San Diego, uh, blue collar family. You know, my grandfather was actually in the Navy; he was stationed in. Los Angeles ended up retiring in San Diego and he started an electrical firm, you know, his year after the military and he had to figure out his career and he had six boys. My dad was the youngest and um, most of them worked at the electric shop. My dad ended up working for a large union shop there, you know, uh, he was a union contractor, but um, his two brothers, my two uncles, I worked for them in high school. So I was an electrician working on these amazing homes in Coronado and Rancho Santa Fe and La Jolla and Anyone that knows South, Southern California, they know the beauty that uh, that those cities, you know, the homes that are there. And so, uh, for me, it's just I, I I love these custom homes. I love these challenging projects. And I was the grunt, you know, I was the youngest cousin, so I got to go into the house and in the roof and <laughs> do all the the tough stuff there uh, as far as electrical goes, especially on these remodels. But um, you know, there was a superintendent that would direct us, and I'm like, I want to be that guy. Like, how do I become that guy to kind of oversee this amazing project from beginning to end and and not just the electrical subcontracting side. So I ended up um, going to college. I, I studied at BYU. I did a construction management degree, um, left in 2005, worked for a production builder for my first year because I want to do custom homes, but no one's going to hire you to build these, you know, million dollar custom homes right out of college with your limited experience. So I worked for a production builder, understood sequencing and management and leadership and working with the team and everything that goes into our job as a superintendent and was fortunate to then be hired by a large firm in Scottsdale. And that firm was had just been hired to build this $350 million hotel resort in Paradise Valley. Just this incredible project. Was fortunate to get in. There's actually custom homes that live on the hotel property. There's 34 residences. They have full access to the hotel, but they live there full time. And that's really when my career took off, you know, met some amazing people. And it was shortly thereafter, I worked for that firm for, you know, five years and then started my firm. So it, it, that, that was a kickstart. And, and here we are almost wow. nine years later at AFT. So I'm sure you learned a ton in those five years, but maybe wind it back to school. What kind of things did you learn in the construction management program that you are grateful you learned, you know, that you took the time to do that? Or are there any things? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's funny because I'm often asked, you know, like this, this is always a tough question with college. And, you know, my opinions changed a lot over the years. I feel that um, y there are some careers that you have to go to college, right? Um, and even then it should still be specialized on that career path. And this would be a, t a topic for another conversation, Nate. Um, but, but to answer your question without going off track, I don't think college is necessary for everyone. However, in my case, there were a couple things I did learn that I feel are very valuable. One, I learned, you know, SureTrack P3 scheduling, massive, right? Learning how to schedule a project, you know, predecessor, successor, and, and work on the software was key. Um, it was just an accelerated way to learn that system. Excel, which I use a ton, you know, building macros, and that's how we've built our, some of our estimating stuff. And, and so those two things were really important. I mean, those are probably the two biggest things that I came out of college was Excel and, um, you know, scheduling. And so fast forward, here I'm in my interview to work for this firm to build this hotel. And this is how my job interview went. I sat in the conference room with the owner of the company and the director of operations. And they said, Brad, build us a schedule. None of them knew. It was Microsoft Project. They didn't know how to use Microsoft Project. 
you know, the developer wanted them to use Microsoft Project. So I came in and, and fortunately I had that college experience and I knocked out that schedule in about 10 minutes there in front of them and they said, you're hired. So that was my interview, right? And, wow. and so that is, that is the benefit there. Um, however, there are some pros, you know, now as I've hired, I don't require anyone that I hire to have a degree, right? It's, it's more the culture fit and we'll teach them the rest. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I know a lot of people feel, and I do as well, I really learned in college more than anything else, just that almost, I'll say like light sheet steel, but like meet a deadline all night or like, I really learned that because I was terrible at school and I was failing classes and like skin of my teeth. And when I'm honest, when I, when I say like what I learned in college, that's something because that sort of like, I don't know instinct to like you 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 got to get through the project or the semester or whatever with passing grades at least for me when i look back might be the most valuable skill or or i don't know muscle that i developed in school which is probably not what they wanted me to do but that's what i came well, away with but but to your point Ed, i think there is some value there and and could that be applied probably if you were working for someone yeah i mean when you talk about it you're speaking of time management i you know for me I was a young father. I had my first daughter when I was in college. I was working full time. I was going to school. So, you know, people say, well, Brad, how do you manage your business now and six kids and social media and everything I've going on? Well, there are some principles that started in college, right? Learning time management, how to be effective, how to hit deadlines, priority, how to pri prioritize my schedule. There is value there. And, and you know, you can't disregard that. Um, not withstanding i mean that possibly could, you and i could have learned that working for a firm being a young father and having the same responsibility right so but there's some truth right accelerated learning being able to pick things up quickly you know college is good for that so i know perspective is important and when i look at the homes that you're building and your social media accounts it just that's high end that's as like nice as it gets how do you feel? Do you feel like there's homes that are four times as big that someday that, that you consider those to be high end? Um, let maybe kind of help us have some perspective on on what it's like as a high end home builder in terms of what, what you think of as a big and nice versus, you know, the rest of us. I love that question, Nate. It's a very complex question, you know, um, and it's interesting. You know, I've often given that a lot of thought and I'll just speak before I answer that question, you know, when you're thinking as a company, you know, your marketing strategy, right? You're thinking about, okay, here I am today. And when we started AFT, no kidding aside, I mean, we were not building a $5 million custom home from day one, right? We're, we're in there doing a bath and we're doing a kitchen, but it was always marketing. I knew we had the understanding. A couple of my employees had worked for me building this hotel. We had the credibility, we had the experience, but we didn't have the reputation under AFT at the time. So we had to start with the kitchen and a bathroom and a small little facelift, but we're always marketing to that big picture, as you say. And when do you arrive? Well, I don't know if we've ever arrived, right? Even though we're doing some amazing homes now. And for me, you know, when I look at custom homes, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just the level of finish. It's not just an expensive cabinet or an expensive appliance. But you look at the complexity, right? Is, you know, as you're building into a, a hillside, if you're doing a building science home, if you're working... Um, you know, ultra modern with a lot of glass and steel and the configuration, how all that goes together. To me, luxury can be defined in so many ways, right? The challenge of the project, the value of the project, the cost of the project. And fortunately, we have a variety of all of them. Um, but I do have admiration for those around the country when I look at their projects and having built some of these tough ones we've done, knowing what they're doing, it, you know, it gives me time to pause because I know the challenge behind it. Yeah, I think I saw a, a skyscraper foundation once in Portland. And so it was like a baby skyscraper, but my mind was blown. It was like this huge hole in the middle of the city. And even just thinking about where did that dirt go and how did they get the trucks? You know, think, things like staging questions that, that really blew my mind that are probably a part of your business as well. Like you said, on a hillside or, or whatever that, man. Well, to your point, Nate, it's funny. I was, my wife and I were in Manhattan. This is years back when they were building the new 9-11 building, right? When they were building that, the memorial. And the complexity, and that's what it goes back to, right? I understand how difficult it is to build a hotel. I've done it. It's, it's extremely challenging, the sequencing, the levels and, and layering. And honestly, just a quick backtrack. When I was in college, I actually worked at, down in California in San Diego um, for a low voltage and structured wiring company. You know, we did fiber optics. And, you know, so I worked in downtown San Diego on these huge 
projects. I worked in these high level casinos on the Indian reservation and on the military base. And they're incredibly complex. And people don't realize going back to the Manhattan is that I look at this in Arizona, I can't even get, I have a ton of desert space, ton of parking, and it's so hard to coordinate staging and product and trades and get the labor done. I can't imagine being in Manhattan. How are you going to bring in with all that traffic, all the material, you know, you're dealing with everything because you're right on the water. So all mm. the complication that goes with building near water, right? All the engineering, it, it, it's amazing. You know, it honestly, anytime I travel around the world or travel to a hotel, I look at that and I'm like, there's a lot of stress that went into this project that people don't realize. What about the, the clientele themselves? Let's say that your clientele is high end. I'll just refer to them that way out of simplicity, but doesn't it seems like there's a, like some challenges that would come with that? You know, these these folks have higher expectations of quality, and they're used to being successful. And sometimes in construction, things don't always go as planned. That's always seemed like a a real downside to building high, nice, beautiful things or big, nice, beautiful things. Is your you know the the clientele might have be more challenging. But I could be completely wrong about that. So may, how do you describe the pros and cons of the clients themselves? Well, you, you get both sides. Look, every client's challenging. I've, I've seen where if you're doing a $25,000 remodel for someone, this, this could be their life savings. They could have refinanced. And so it's very important. They're going to be on you. And it's no different doing $5 million, right? There, there's no breath of fresh air per se in our career and choice of, um, uh, of, of what we're doing. But to that point, it is a little bit more difficult, right? And when I, when I say that, it's you know, the higher clientele can tend at times to be unrealistic if you don't set the proper expectations. They can be at times a little more demanding, right? Or demand a little bit more attention, you know, and then they also are a little bit more savvy as far as, you know, schedules, litigated damages or liquidated damages, right? And, and these are things that come into play. I will say that the one pro is that most of our clientele, because they're at that level they built before. So they've been through mm -hmm. the experience, um, and even though they may be a tough personality and really hard on our team, they've been through it. So they understand the process. It's really tough when you're working for a first-time home buyer that's built for the first time. And it doesn't matter what level of the spectrum they are financially, they're, they're always tough. So I prefer the more savvy one. They're going to be tougher on me. They're going to make me accountable. You know, I can't blow smoke anywhere. We have to be very systematic in our approach, but you know, the process t tends to go better, even though they're a little bit more hands-on. Yeah, that's, that's neat. You know, I've always visualized my dad is a builder and he's like an extremely hands-on almost too much because he's, that's just the way he is. He loves building the, the actual like mechanics of it. And it's, it's really beautiful, but it was a long time till I realized that most building happens by not by people wearing the bags, but by, you know, architects, designers and then even the contractor who is who's primarily just kind of orchestrating like a symphony conductor so my question is because you've you've done both of that and are there any parts of the trades that you even in your home repair like doing yourself you know actual sort of mechanical trades work that you enjoy for the sake of it or are you so busy orchestrating that you kind of bring in the pros for everything you know, I will say I miss the days of putting on a tool bag, you know, being there with the crew, being on site, um, working side by side. And, um, you know, I just, I enjoy that. I enjoy the, the joy that comes from that sweat labor, right? Um, at this point in my career, it is difficult, you know, as you start to get busier and, you know, family and personal obligations and company obligations and employees, uh, you know, I would love to be able to have time to do some trim work in my house or, you know, do yeah. some electrical. And for now, I just find that joy doing a little bit of yard work or cleaning the <laughs> pool. <laughs> but yeah, it's okay. Exactly. I love to get out and pull weeds. And and I used to mow the lawn. We put an artificial turf now, but they're still hedging, you know, that I need to trim. And I don't have a landscaper, so I do it myself. So I do yeah. that, but but I miss the trades. It's just I don't have the time flexibility to do that anymore. You know, yard work really, there's a reason that dads do yard work on the weekends. And it's not because it's fun. <laughs> it's because just kind of solving making something look nice there really is like a moment to kind of reset and i love doing my own yard work and i'm glad to hear you kind of st you could obviously hire somebody to do it pretty easily but there's something about dads doing yard work on weekends that as i've got to that point in life i'm like oh yeah i can see now why that's sort of 
I don't know. Yeah, some stereotype. of that minor ma- minor maintenance amount the, around the house, I do enjoy that. You know, yeah. I wish I had a little bit more time, maybe to do some built ins or, or keep up on some of the honeydew list. But um, but for now, you know, do what I can. I think that's like the ne- that's the grandfather phase, and there's there's another reason why little kids have memories of doing building with their grandfathers is because grandfathers then kind of have the time to pick up woodworking. So that's mm-hmm. like a there's like a life sequence there. Okay, so back to about high-end building a little bit. It occurs to me, and as I've listened to your show a bit, that one pro of working with these more expensive homes is you 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 have professional designers and architects on the job, whereas on a on a lower budget project, that might be something that kind of falls to the the general contractor in sort of communicating some of those big picture issues. So, is that correct? You pretty much always have pe- other people, professionals handling that and if so what's that like that is another great question and i would challenge anyone listening if you're not doing this or haven't made this uh, operating procedure you know for your company do so and it doesn't have to be just catered to the ultra wealthy or the ultra elite um you know there's remodels can have a designer selecting everything and so we won't we we made a company policy just over three years ago that we will not do the project whether it be commercial residential or renovation, unless they have an architect and designer. And that's it. And honestly, and ideally a a landscape architect as well, if we're doing something with the, with the landscape package, but, um, it's key. You know, what I learned is that, and this goes back to your earlier question or not even question, but you made a statement Nate. you were speaking about how, when you look at these complex builds, right? I have a background in commercial in commercial, uh, there are projects with designers, but typically the architect is designing interior next year. Architects doing the whole full design kit. But I can assure you, there is no GC that's operating and going to be beginning this project without all the selections made. And these clients that are extremely savvy, these developers are going to make sure it's selected. One, they can hold the contractor's feet to the fire, right? And in commercial, you're dealing with liquidated damages and there's timelines and responsibilities and there's costs because every time a Walmart's delayed. These are, you know, they Walmart's already scheduling all their trucks, right, in transit to to s- stock that store every day late. That's 150, 200 grand that you're being hit. So they're going to make sure everything's spec to the T. So then that way you can price it. There's some price security and there's some timeline security. Why we don't do that in residential is beyond me. I know it's more emotional. It can be bigger, but I tell people we're doing homes that are 20, 30,000 square feet, 13, 14 bathrooms. Everything's selected down to every piece of cabinet hardware and bath accessory and flooring tile, right? And and it can be done. It just takes more time in the prep work. And even though we may have everything decided, I may still have 100 change orders from the client, but I can build more efficiently. I can build accurately. There's less stress on my team. And, you know, the process with, and communication with the client is just that much better. There's so much, like communication and sometimes communication like that just takes a lot of time and it seems like between a designer and a contractor and then an architect even on the front end do you you ever find that i don't know people are more likely to waste your time almost or do you just kind of wait till you 100 percent know this is a dead serious client before you go to that phase or it just seems like a lot of people kind of having to communicate in order to solve and make all these plans so Maybe talk about the actual timeline of when a, a homeowner or b- prospective client wants to build. Where, how do they start and how do they go through that sequence to take up the least amount of your time? I love that you share that, Nate, because honestly, I find the most time is wasted when you break ground and you don't have the selections, right? Or if you're on a renovation that the client's so excited for you to come in and demo, and then you're waiting for lead time and cabinetry. And, and, and so, so much time's lost because the client's putting pressure on us or you as the builder to say, we need to get going. I need to be in by a certain date. We need to get the project started, break ground. And we're excited. We want to make the client happy. We want to get the project going. We want to get it underground, right? So that we can get our crews going. And we do ourselves such a disservice because to your point, there, we waste more time. If, if you have everything up front, our process, you know, it may take eight months. It may take 12 months. It may take 14 months from our very first conversation until I have a permanent hand. And that's okay. It's a long process and it should be because now the build, I can really cater into a small box and I can hit that out of the park. So for us, the way it'd start, you know, in a perfect world, which 
we're achieving to do, right, is that our client hires a designer, architect, builder together. And as a team, now we're working through the floor plan design, which is phase one that takes probably four weeks. And then once the client signs off, then we go to the ceiling heights and the elevation. And once that's signed off, now we can really hit the ground running where the designer will make all the interior selections, the architect's doing all the structurals and civil, and we're still meeting twice a month via Zoom or in person to make sure what the designer's doing and the architect doing are still meeting hand in hand, right? And then I'm helping oversee all of that to make sure they're within budget. So there, there's really not a lot of time wasting. This goes back to the savvy client. The savvy clients that can appreciate as you set that expectation of why you're doing this, that it's going to save them time on the project. It's going to save them dollars of carrying costs and change orders. And they're going to have a bigger ROI because if you have a home by a designer, it's going to look better. It's going to resell higher. You know, these are all pros that the clients can get behind. We just have to set the expectation and manage that process. And that's why they do that. And when you think about time, you know, from a client side, they'll pay me a retainer. I charge them a retainer for my time in pre-construction. And then I credit that when we break ground. So that gives me some security that I'm the builder. And if something were to happen, at least my time's covered for the, what I put into the project. Hmm. Are designers and architects able to work, you know, like across, I'll say across state lines easily? I know contractors, the licensing gets kind of, it kind of wrecks it, but are people able to bring in designers from other places or how do you advise people when they're trying to select a designer and an architect to, you know, who to hire? That's a great question. So that is one of the true benefits that an architect and designer have is they're, they can work, they're global, right? They can work anywhere. Us as contractors, you have a licensing issue. You also have a subcontractor issue. You know, for me to set up shop and build in Beverly Hills, well, my subs, I don't have subs there, right? So I don't have those relationships. So it's a little more challenging for me, whereas a designer can. So we, you know, especially with COVID, right? Everyone's doing Zoom anyways. Even my local architects and designers, we're meeting via Zoom half the time. Um, and that's really been the case for me anyways, because being in Scottsdale, 60% of my clientele lives out of state. They're coming mm -hmm. from the West Coast. They're coming from the Midwest. They have second homes here. So we're very adaptive to working with clients that are not here every day. And because of that, we have many designers and architects that are not from Arizona that we work with on our projects, even ones we have currently. So it, it's definitely not um, an inhibitor to the project. And really, it comes down to just making sure that the relationship's good between the three. Hmm. Uh, you know, we can solve most everything together as long as we have, you know, builder, architect, designer. I know there's some guys listening to this who understand what you're saying, but they just know for their clients and the way their business works, it's the budget still doesn't fit. So as a builder, what kind of things can other builders or let's just say contractors learn about design? Not that they have to do that for their client, but well, like yourself, what have you learned a lot about design since you, you know, left the hotel and started doing this types of thing? And, and if so, like what type of big concept design light bulbs have gone off for you over the years? Yeah, I've learned a tremendous amount. You know, as, as I work with designers on every project, you, you begin to see their value, right? The, the, this isn't as easy as picking a backsplash and picking a, you know, picking a countertop. It's a lot more, it's more complex when you're thinking about budget and lead times and projects that will wear and tear for the lifestyle of the client, right? That'll perform for us as the contractor to warranty. And, and not only that, but the back end stuff. I mean, for me, I'm fortunate to work with designers that are giving me full design books and CAD drawings. And so all the automation and CAD and plans and drafting that they're doing is essential for me to bid it right. And so what I would say, you know, as these contractors are listening and, and say, Brad, you know, there's, you know, in my market, the clients are going to pay for it. They're not going to pay for a designer, right? They're just not. And, and I have yet to find that to be the case, you know, as I speak with builders around the country, because... In every community, right, you do have clients that are driving a Tesla or they're driving a Mercedes. You know, why Why is that? There's a value there. There's there's a way it makes them feel right. There's a quality level. And so not every client's going to be that way, but some will. And, and, and it's very applicable to what we're doing when the client really is us as the contractor. If we set the client up to say, look, if we have a budget, the designer's not going to drive the cost. If we have a budget of $10 a square foot for your backsplash tile, this designer is going to stay within that parameter of that pricing. But the designer has relationships with 30 tile stores, right? They can source, 
you know, and then I'm not having to run around with you. Your time's saved because you're investing in the designer so you can focus on your business. Your home will sell for more. You're going to be more inspired, right? You're living at home. You're probably working from home now with COVID, you know, so why not have a home that makes you feel good, inspires you, that's going to resell for more, you know, where you have a designer that has these relationships that have, can source product. And, and for me as the builder, it saves me a ton of time. I don't want to go sit at the plumbing showroom for four hours of my day and pick plumbing fixtures. You know, my designer can do that, present it to the client, put it on a, on a, um, Excel doc and on my design book. And then I can send it out for hard pricing. And that's the final point too, is that I, I let our clients know, you know, the disadvantage kitchen cabinetry is a great example. If I am working with you, Nate, to design your kitchen and we don't have a designer, I'm going to have to go to a kitchen and bath showroom. They're going to design your kitchen. They're going to do the cabinet drawings, but you and I have no say as far as their pricing, their options their upgrades, they're doing the cabinet design. There's a cost to that. And we have no control. Whereas if the designer is doing the cabinet drawings, why well, can send these out now to three cabinet firms and get mm -hmm. the best price and it's locked in God, and I don't yeah. have to have this open ticket. Genius. There's also, yeah, we had a tile guy doing a shower a couple weeks ago and I kind of asked just generally like, what do you think in terms of a layout question? And I was struck how like definitively he was like, I'm not deciding something like that. And I was thinking, oh, that makes sense. And what I'm hearing from you also, you're by having a designer, you almost, you don't outsource, you remove some of that risk where if you build something that someone doesn't like because of an aesthetic choice, a, a contractor who maybe made himself the designer also is taking the risk of having to satisfy somebody's taste that didn't work out. Whereas if, if you're just kind of like, I just built it. You, you guys sort out if you don't like the way it turned out, that would, I, I'm sure there's some contractors who've gotten themselves in that situation. And well, like this tile guy, that's why he probably was quick to say like, I'm not, I'm not going to make an opinion on that. Well, and what I love too, I mean, you bring up a great point there, Nate, is that for what, I mean, there's an arm's length, right? Of liability when, when it comes to, I don't like this tear it out. Right. And, and that is true to consider, but also even now all of us are having issues with um, ordering and purchasing and storage, right? Whereas if I have a design and I already know today, I know every piece of tile in, in there and I know all the six distributors that are giving me this tile product, I can contact them way in advance. I can get it on order. I could have them store it, right? It's priced competitively because I've sent it out to multiple trades. I know to the very inch because I have CAD drawings show me the entire shower surround or the backsplash detail. Well, it allows me now from a purchasing and acquisition standpoint to be more successful because I'm not designing as I go. And all of a sudden we pick a tile that's 12 weeks. I know it's 12 weeks and I'm going to order it 18 weeks ahead of time, you know? So it actually makes my superintendent's job a lot easier. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so I know we have contractors listening to this and that's who I'm imagining as our, as our audience. And you've done, you've taken an enormous amount of time and effort to build out your social media. And I guess I shouldn't say enormous because it doesn't have to be an enormous amount of time, but you have a pretty serious um, social media presence. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that and explain why you think that's worth the investment of time and energy and how it impacts your business. And if you think it's something other contractors should, even if it's not natural to them, if it's something that they should invest, you know, some of their time and energy into. I love that. And this is probably a topic we could speak about for two hours, but <laughs> if a client's not, if, if any of you listening are not on social media, um, I, I would highly advise you to quickly figure out a way to make it important and make it a priority. Um, and, and let's put away the business development or lead generation for just a second. But when you think about the collaboration in the community, so for me, I, although I had some amazing experiences working for two other companies, Although I have a degree in construction management, you know, I've never ran a company before, you know, pricing, you know, I was, when I first started social media, wasn't a huge deal when I started my company. So I'm figuring out the hard way I'm underbidding stuff. I'm losing money. I'm not sure how to make money. I'm not even sure what I'm doing. I mean, that's just this reality. I know we want to paint this picture that we came out of gates and then we're doing this beautiful stuff and that's not reality. And it was painful, right? It's painful. I talked to Matt Reisinger about this all the time that it took, you know, five years before he started making money. I mean, you just, you're trying to figure out the business. Here's what social media has done is now I have a direct connection with builders across the country in my network that I could DM. They don't compete with me. They're never going to be a competitor. And they can say, hey, Brett, 
Here's what you should be charging. Here's the percentage. Here's what you should pay somebody. Here's how you handle insurance. Oh, litigation. I've dealt with this issue or this defect, you know, or install. And so you have this community where I have direct information, unlike ever before, unlimited, that I can reach out in this network. I'm dealing with a tough client. I could talk to other peers. How, how would you handle this? How would you handle a client that's demanding this when it's not in the contract? And so all these things are solved because you build that network. You know, it's social media. Be social. Build that network. Build that community. It's highly valuable. And then you think about marketing. I was this young kid. So I'm even though I, I worked on this hotel and I make these amazing architects, it's time for me to start my business. I'm knocking on the door. You know, I'm going to their office. I'm emailing them. I'm calling them. And they would never return my call or email because they're like, who's Brad? We don't care about AFT. We're already... We already have five builders. You know, we don't need this young guy that has no experience. And so what I found is that being young, you know, I started building my following on LinkedIn. I started building our social media on Instagram. And these same architects that would never return my call start following me on these platforms. And then, you know, it's non, you know, I don't have to solicit them. It's non-confrontational. I just post and update and they get to see it. And they get to see hmm. the systems and the progress and the quality to the point where both these architects years later called me and said, Brad, you need to talk to me about what you're doing on social media. Let's have dinner. So now I'm having dinner at their request, give them some points. And here I am doing, you know, two to three projects with each of them. That would not have been the case without social media. So it's an easy way to get in front of my customer base without being super salesy. Yeah. That's the best sales pitch for a contractor to get involved. I've heard yet. <laughs> yeah. So kind of mechanically, how would you then recommend they do it you've you're using linkedin and instagram and, I, and you have a podcast but let's say someone has zero right now and let's say there's some specialty sub like i don't know glass shower glass or whatever so how does that subcontractor if you were that subcontractor what would you do to to go down that road so two things one uh and this goes back to a lot of subcontractors ask me well how do i build how do I be, you know, non-confrontational and not solicit my audience? So here's what I, from my point of view as a general contractor, what drives me nuts is someone goes on LinkedIn. The first time we connect, they send me a DM. Hey, Brad, I want to sell you this shower glass, right? Total turnoff. However, same thing with Instagram. If this shower glass company follows me and they're supporting me in every post, they're liking it, they're commenting, you know, oh, I love that house. I love what you did here on that detail. I love whatever, you know. And I see the same person comment for two, three months as an active follower, an active supporter. And they're like, hey, Brad, you know, we have this amazing product. I saw you post about this. This may be a great support. I'm more inclined to say, let's meet, right? Because this isn't some cold person. There's a relationship built. And this goes back to social media. You can build relationships virtually. And then when you see the, you know, see them in person, you're like, you feel like you already know them. That's the advantage of social media is a connector. So that's the advice I give for someone to start their company. Now, content is wide open. The, the reason I push LinkedIn and Instagram the most is the community, right? People, um, you can build through stories, you can build a personality, a camaraderie, you know, DM. LinkedIn is valuable because what I love about LinkedIn, whenever in the past could I go um, to, to Kohler and connect with David Kohler, right? If I were to call Kohler and try to get a hold of David, they're not going to connect me to him, but I could connect to him on LinkedIn and he can see my stuff. I don't even have to say anything, right? So you can connect. In, in my market, I could connect with every top real estate broker, every realtor. I can, you know, every CEO, doctors that work at the Mayo Clinic, you know, cancer doctors, you know, radiology, um, architects, designers. So these are my clients. These are my network and I'm direct connect and I'm posting. So seven influences to, to close a sale. I need to be at the top of their board in mind all the time. And it's just a great way to do that by putting out good content that they want to see you know, and, and show the behind the scenes, show the finished product, you know, show that diversification. Oh, that's incredible. Do you ever worry or maybe not worry, but what about your actual customers? Cause they're following your accounts and listening to your podcast as well. Do you ever feel like you could black out some of the interviews that the actual paying customers don't listen to, or do they even, <laughs> are you even thinking about them? You know, I am thinking about them. I'm very conscious as far as, you know, uh, uh, you know, how I speak and the content I'm putting out there and, um, you know, especially now, you know, being non-political, a lot of these things that can be very divisive out there. So my clients listen. The funny thing is I just had two new clients meet with me this week on building their projects that they'll be building next year and the year after from out of state. 
and they listen to all my podcasts, all of them. <laughs> and it's the first time I met them. And so they are listening. But but here's the advantage. That this is why, you know, when you're looking at your marketing strategy, you'll never see uh, me go out there and say, oh, you want this beautiful home? Call me, right? It's Don't be salesy. Like, it's just, look at this beautiful kitchen. Look at this apron shelf, right? You want to point out details. You want to point out things you're doing. And then let the customer on their own consume what they want and reach out to you as they're, as they're ready for their project. So you just have to build this audience and, and just be cautious. Show them the systems. What I found is that the more information about the, our process, the better. You know, I just had a client in here now. And they're like, Brad, we've listened on your podcast. We watch all your posts. We know we got to get a designer. We got to get an architect. <laughs> Meet with you. And then it's going to be eight months till we're ready to get our permit. And how easy is that? Like I've already yeah. educated them. I don't have to do anything. It's just does the budget work? Does our personality work? And so put out the information you want the client to consume and the audience to consume and then let them put the rest together. Uh, that's amazing. You know, there's probably some times where you can almost – uh, get in front of some issues. I'm thinking about rising lumber prices and just like the Im impact that's having. And you're probably have some customers right now who are learning. Anyways, you, you know, it's like an opportunity to even talk about market trends and swings that you're probably going to have to talk about with them anyways, at some point, it's just a way to get it to them quicker and maybe even, I don't know, more accurately in, in some cases. Right. Yeah, and I love that you share that, Nate, because the reality, that's the value of Instagram stories or LinkedIn videos, is that you can show what the market's trending for lumber, for steel, for PVC. You know, what are delays? We're having these delays without calling out a brand to throw them under the bus, but you can say, we're having an issue with AC condensers or refrigeration, right? And so you can educate the public so they know, hey, these are things we're dealing with. This is on a national level. It's on a local level. You know, we're having an issue with plumbing or masonry, and that's where you can almost take that tough conversation out because it's so neutral, you know, posting for them to consume. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, maybe my last question for you here, or at least topic, is you're obviously a really skilled communicator, and I'm sure to some extent that was natural, but also you've practiced and developed it. So to what extent do you practice and work on improving your communication? I know you speak to cameras a, a fair amount, which is not easy. So how are you how are you developing this skill, which is probably the most valuable one you have, or at least it could be? Why? Well, I, <laughs> I appreciate the kind words, Nate. It's you know, it's something that I feel like I'm learning as I go, like any of us. I wish, you know, this goes back to the college thing. I took in in college, I took one class that was public speaking and I hated it. Like it gave me anxiety. I'd get in there and you have to speak, you know, and I didn't pay very much attention. I kind of just tried to get through that class. I wish now I would have spent a lot more time and actually pursued that at a greater level. So it's something that I've wanted to do more formal training and haven't. But to your point, you know, in, in life, it's interesting. You know, I played sports all through high school, you know, and, and, you know, I was out, I did sales, you know, I, I lived outside the country for a couple of years in Argentina. Um, you know, learn, I speak fluent Spanish. I, I went to college. And so, you know, running a company, you just learn different people and cultures. And what I find is the more educated you can be, the more people you speak with, right. And understand it's easier to have a conversation, right. The more inf information you consume. But as far as communication, it's just, you know, speaking with someone such as yourself, Nate, and, and picking up on that, what I found from my podcast is that as I interview guests, there's things they say that I pick up on, right. That I'll apply to my business and make changes. Um, you know, listening to podcasts and downloading information. And then going back to the social media topic that we've been hammering on a little bit is that I built this community where not I built, but you know, I'm exposed to this community that of people that can share information. And what I find is the more educated you are on a topic, the more assertive you can be if you're in front of the camera or behind the microphone mm -hmm. and speak with the shirt because you've done it. You've, you've seen it, you've seen the success or you've seen the failures and it's a lot easier to communicate that. So I, I always ask that same question, you know, great public speakers, you know, how do you become great? They know the topic, the topic they're speaking about. They, they are so seasoned and understand it. They can get up and speak with confidence. And so they're not nervous about the audience because they know the content. When we're not prepared, it's no different than building a home. If we're not prepared, then we prepare to fail, right? And it becomes more difficult. That is, I've heard that before, but I forgot about it till now. I, I can't remember where I heard it, but it was very similar to that. Like you need to know whatever, like eight times the con, what you want to say, and then you can talk about it. it for hours. And so yeah. speaking about it for 15 minutes, 
is nothing because you you could speak about it all day. That is so interesting. And yeah, I think that's exactly right. Well, well, it's funny because I speak to, so Mark La, Lib- La Liberté is a client of mine and he is a consultant and he does building science stuff. And he and I have spoke about length because he's so good in front of the camera, in front of audience. And he said the same thing. He's like, Brad, if you, if I were to talk about how to flash a window, you know, I've done this so many times, you know, I, I know all the products and all the techniques and I've spoke, spoken about it. I've researched it. I've done my due diligence. He's so prepared that, yeah, for him to get up and speak 20 minutes about it, no problem. If you were to say, get up and talk to me about NFL free agency, he'd be lost, right? Because it's <laughs> like, it's a total different thing. But, but that's what it comes down to. The more prepared you are in that yeah. topic and that information, the more research you do, the more confidence you can have. And this is really important for any business owner. I look now, if I were to sell a job today, I'm a lot more confident in my approach than I was six years ago. Because I've vetted clients and I've learned the mistakes I've made, which are many, and I still continue to make plenty that, you know, I know the pitfalls where when a client wants to take another direction, I say, no, we're not doing that because I've already made that mistake. And, and you can speak with confidence and, and it really helps build the trust of the client. God, that's incredible. Hey, last question. I love hearing when uh, someone who's got a great business and social media pre- pre- uh, presence um, shares you don't have to share about your family but i know you have a family and do you do you find that balance challenging uh, to what extent are your kids involved in any of this uh, I, it's important because for me my kids are like my whole world and and yet like with work everybody kind of it's like work only but most of us have families that are actually you know occupying huge amounts of the space and i assume that's the case with you it is so uh and i'd love to speak about that so i have six children you know five girls and a boy my oldest daughter will actually be 17 tomorrow so she's gonna be 17 and then i have another daughter that's 15 12 seven five uh, seven and then a son that's five and a daughter that's three so my my son's the only boy you know number five and he's also five and um you know it's amazing they 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 love to see what dad does i mean my older teenage daughters of course on social media so they get to see my day and they get to see the projects. They love coming to tour them. And really, when you t- speak about balance, it's funny, Nate, because what's your priority? I mean, you, you know, I s- th- there's a couple of builders in particular we're just speaking about this where, you know, in, in life, what are we pursuing? For me, an ideal scenario, it's a work-life balance, which is pretty much impossible. But in a perfect world, um, you know, work hard, play hard. And I do. Like during the week, it's very busy. There's a lot of commitments to the company and to my firm. But I do find that we tried as a family three to four weeks a year scattered throughout the year that we have time, you know, we go on vacation and spend time so that they have dad around. So, and I try to, especially on the weekends, not be at work and be at their golf, you know, matches and be at soccer and dance and musical performance. So I have to balance that schedule. That's the benefit of being a business owner, but super important that, that, you know, to be involved in their lives as well. Yeah, it's helpful too because, like in in business, when you know someone else has a family or has kids, it's just it's like this common bond. Also, I'm sure like your your clients just knowing you have your family man and you've got this uh, this these people who are your own. It's just there's something about it that's kind of like oh yeah, fellow traveler here. And so I, I think that's <laughs> certainly like a not necessarily something to be left out of the equation. I don't know if that means like put them in TV commercials, which I've seen <laughs> before as well, but. You know, no, but I love that you left that that tidbit there, Nate, because what I've seen, going back to the marketing, you know, I've seen where Instagram has been very valuable because stories, I really showcase a little bit of the personal life, right? Yeah. You know, being at my kids' events and being at their performances and being on vacation with them. And really what it does, it makes you a real person, right? You're yes. not just this business owner or whatever. You're a real person, your dad, your husband. And so it softens it. And, and I find that the clientele that reaches out to us has a soft heart for that. I can appreciate that and see that we're young and they know, and it's a sales pitch for me. Hey, I'm going to be around. We're not going anywhere. I got six <laughs> kids to raise, right? So yeah. it gives them some assurity that we're here to warranty their project. I'm not disappearing. Yeah, so there is value right. there for sure. It's really clicked. I was talking to Sean Van Dyke, who you probably know, and he, he mentioned he has a bunch of kids and in the context of how he consults his clients and, and along the lines of, I got five kids. Of course, this is a business me making money for them. And it was in my mind, like a light bulb, like, that's how I feel about my business. I've got a bunch of kids. And so I love the work and everything we do, but everybody should know that I've got a family that we're also supporting here. So it's just really, uh, I, don't, I love, I love knowing that. Well, Brad, thanks so much. I'm going to link to your Instagram and your podcast. And for the listeners, especially on these design um, questions, you've had some really great designers on the show talking about design and 
And if you're not able to hire one for your job, you can at least, you can still get a lot, Not a, you can get real value by listening to the way they think and talk. And your podcast is, is one place where they can do that. So y- y- there's a lot of free information out there if you just kind of get yourself in front of it. And I would definitely point to your podcast, although it covers a variety of topics, but design is one that has really stood out to me. And a lot of that design you can see in your in your work, in the photos. So is there anywhere else we should point the listeners to um, for your work? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it, pretty simple. We're uh, common thread, AFT construction on all the social media channels. It's AFT underscore construction on, on most of them. And then for LinkedIn, it's just Brad Levitt. Look at Brad Levitt. And of course, the podcast is the AFT Construction Podcast. Try to keep that branding pretty tight. And same as YouTube. I think YouTube's AFT Construction as well. So um, pretty easy to find us. All right, Brad. Well, can't wait to see what you do next. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, Nate. Well, thanks for sticking with that to the end. I want to make two follow-up points that are on my mind after that discussion with Brad. Number one, I just am still thinking about his point about social media and how valuable that is for a tradesman or a small business, a contractor, to have this network of other uh, similar businesses across the country, how useful that can be sharing information and, and tips, and then how that, how that account, let's say, can open doors for, for people who may not have worked with you or given time or, or consideration before, just having a, a little social media presence can sort of be a, a door opening uh, device. And so I thought that was really accurate. And, and I want to mention about social media, we obviously go, I would say overboard in how much we put into the videos and we have, I'm able to kind of be a full-time camera person when my dad is working. So that's, that's one way to do it, but you don't have to do that. There are so many great uh, YouTube channels and great Instagram accounts that are just a person taking a few pictures with their phone and posting it of their work or, or if they're doing video, just setting up a GoPro. In fact, I have mine right here. I'll bring it in the frame, but just setting a GoPro up and hitting go on a time lapse and letting it run for a few hours. It really doesn't take that much time or setup after you kind of get the hang of it. Um, it, it doesn't interrupt your day all that much. You may be able to hand it off to someone else to edit the videos later, and it can certainly open doors. I have seen so many good ch- accounts lately of contractors and tradesmen doing this lawn cutting companies, concrete uh, companies, tile guys, and um, dirt work guys and just all every swimming pool contractors and roofing contractors. There's, there's a lot of folks doing this type of thing with great results. And I would definitely, um, I would definitely, uh, underscore Brad's point that it it's can only be a positive thing. The second thing I want to mention is related to that. He, he mentioned cost, I think, and, and how understanding costs and, and how, Social media and interacting and building a network on there of even similar tradesmen can help, you know, dial in costs and and estimating. We just made a video about costs on our channel and unfortunately it just didn't work out. That happens sometimes where we'll finish a video and kind of look it back over and feel like it's not quite good enough to put out to the whole audience. And so it goes into kind of a junk drawer of stuff that maybe we'll put out someday. And the point of that video, which I which I still think is really helpful, is it, people will say a lot of times, and it's almost a little bit lazy, but they'll say things like, "Well, whatever you know, what I pay for the product or service here is is not relevant to anybody else in the country because prices change so much depending on where you are," and that's true to an extent. But I think that prices are are more similar than they are different. You know, just like wages and salaries across the country, do they vary? Yes, but within not not a huge amount, and it's they kind of vary like on similar tiers. So they you know in terms of uh, proportions to other trades and crafts. So I think that the prices that that people are charging and paying in other parts of the country are helpful and valuable information, um, even if you're not in that exact location. So Brad's point about social media kind of reminded me of that um, that moment of that video that may never see the light of day. So I hope you enjoyed it. Brad's a really great guy, and man, I'm impressed by his uh, his work. If you could just go to his Instagram account and scroll through. It's absolutely beautiful. In fact, one of the things we didn't talk about, but 
I'm sure he would have a lot to say about is, is photography itself. I'm sure he has professional ph photographers who go through once his homes are done, 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 done and uh, get some of those really beautiful pictures. But it's amazing what you can do with just a cell phone these days. So don't let that slow you down if you're on the fence about posting and sharing uh, your content, the things you build. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking with us to the very bitter end of this. And we'll catch you next time.